Okay, thanks, Elizabeth, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, National Academy of Sciences Committee on Earth Resources. Uh, my name is Jim Slotes. I'm the chair of the Committee on Earth Resources, and uh, when I'm not volunteering for this committee, I serve as the Director of Study Operations for the National Petroleum Council. Uh, we're very excited about today's program, uh, which um, is, is our first in beginning the discussion on, uh, on, uh, on the issues of uh, what kind of earth sciences are needed. Hang on just a second. I'm uh, sorry, my, uh, I think I'm still here, but somehow I'm losing my, my screen. Can you guys your still hear me? Is, your video is a little slow, Jim, um, but your, your voice is, is great. So it's just a little okay. Tough. Okay, sorry about that. I lost my connection screen, so I'll reconnect in a minute. Uh, but uh, I, I just I, I I can't see the presentations right now. Um, anyway, uh, so the um, the committee on Earth, on Earth resources has been exploring the topic of what are Earth resources changes and opportunities in an energy transition, and. Uh, we, um, we had planned a, a full in-person, full day in-person meeting. And then with, the, uh, with all the changes that we're all dealing with, we switched to a, um, this uh, webinar based and we, we reduced it and focused on one, one component of that and that's carbon capture use and storage. And uh, we will be continuing to, to explore this theme in, in future meetings and we have a, an exciting future plan on that. So today we're very fortunate to have four speakers with us today who will discuss different aspects of CCUS and we'll, we look forward to a lively uh, discussion and conversation uh, with them. Before we get underway with some brief introductions of our, uh, for our speakers, let me turn it over to uh, Elizabeth Aidy with the National Academies that will give us a little bit of uh, logistics and then um, and can uh, 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 and introduce our, our committee members. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here today. It's really terrific to see all of you here, uh, committee members, our speakers, and uh, a lot of friends and colleagues. Um, my name is Elizabeth Ada, as Jim said, and I direct the Committee on Earth Resources for the National Academies. We're delighted to be here uh, this morning to have a, this program about carbon capture utilization and storage. And before I get to some of the logistics for a meeting and the introductions of our committee members, I did want to offer my sincere thanks to um, Eric Edkin from our staff team, um, who has been a great support and, and is, is basically, we're all dependent on Eric, I'll just put it that way, because he's running the show for us. And he's uh, done a magnificent job uh, in the preparation for the meeting. So thanks a lot to him for, for helping with this whole program. So I'll review the agenda for you today. Um, I think all of you will have seen that um, uh, during the registration process. But I wanted particularly to draw your attention to how you can provide uh, feedback uh, and questions for the speakers, because we really want to try to make this setting as interactive as possible and we need your help to do so. Obviously with a large number of people logging on, um, we wanna make it as, as uh, organized as we can to make sure we get to as many of your questions as, as is possible. So all of our speakers will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of their time blocks for discussion related to their presentations. And Cindy and Nigel are, are, have a combined presentation, so we'll wait until both of them are finished before opening the floor to questions. We also have time set aside at the end of today's session, about 25 minutes or so, for further questions or discussion related to any of the talks or questions directed to the whole group. Um, and we do have a short stretch uh, break at around noon Eastern time, and we want to maintain that because we're all finding, I think, that breaks are important with these Zoom meetings. Um, to avoid background noise, Eric's going to keep everyone muted during the presentations. And so to ask a question, uh, you see the instructions there on your screen. You want, we would like you to use the hand raise, the raise hand feature for all your comments and questions. And what you do is you wave your, your cursor down below. You're probably all professionals at this by now, but wave your cursor down at the bottom of your screen. You'll see this participants um, button 
you click on that and you'll see a, a panel that opens off to the side. At the bottom of that panel is this blue rays hand feature. So you just click on that and a hand will come up by your name and the host will unmute your microphone once you're, you're called on. You won't be able to unmute, you, unmute your own microphone. And the, the order of the blue hands from top to bottom is actually the order that people raise their hands. So Jim doesn't even have to worry about keeping track of that. He can just start at the top and go down the list. And again, we'll try to get to as many of you as, you, as we can during the Q&A periods. You can also, if you don't want to uh, give your question orally, if you want to post comments or questions via the chat function, you can do that by sending a message to everyone. And then this chat function is also uh, down at the bottom of the screen if you wave your, um, your cursor over that. And if you have technical questions, we'd like you to reach out specifically to Eric and you should be able to, to get uh, some information back to Eric as the host um, uh, through the, the chat function, or you could email him at eedkin at nas.edu. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to uh, mention to you too that the session is being recorded and we will be posting the session, the recording audio and, and visual of the session on our website um, probably a week or so after the meeting. And for all of you who registered, we'll certainly let you know when that posting has, uh, has taken place. So with that said, I wanted to ask our committee members, I think uh, all of them are on, or nearly all of them are on, and uh, just to, to introduce yourselves, name and your affiliation, uh, and then I'll turn things back to Jim to introduce our speakers. So Jim, I, we've already introduced you, so I'll just go down the list here as, as, our, as our members are listed. Um, we'll start with you, Bridget, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Bridget Ayling. Um, I'm an associate professor at the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm also the director of the Great Basin Center for Geothermal Energy. Excellent. Thanks, Bridget. Carmen? Hi, I'm Carmen Agaritas. Um, I'm an Extension Associate Professor in um, Biosystems Agricultural Engineering at the University of Kentucky. And uh, Dan? Hello, everyone. Dan Connell, Vice President of Business Development and Technology for Consol Energy, uh, based in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Thanks, Dan. Good morning, David. Yeah, good morning. This is David Spears. I'm the state geologist of Virginia and formerly a petroleum geologist. Hello, Deborah. Great to have you with us. Hi, Deborah Peacock. I'm a metallurgical engineer and a uh, registered patent attorney. And I'm also on some corporate boards involved with copper mining, uh, lithium and graphite mining and alternative energy. And I'm the uh, chair of the Board of Regents at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. So today will be really important for that role as well. Thanks, Deborah. Uh, Joel? Uh, hi, I'm Joel Renner. I'm retired from the Idaho National Laboratory and previously uh, the USGS, where I work primarily on geothermal energy. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Joel. And John Marsden. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is John Marsden. Um, I'm a mineral technology engineer. I head up a consulting business in the Western US, uh, specializing in gold, copper, and cobalt extraction. Perfect, thank you so much, John. And Jim, I think that's, uh, that's the, the committee uh, introductions completed, so I'll turn things back to you to get us underway. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, appreciate it, and uh, we'll we'll get here underway. I'll just share that uh, you know we talked about this being uh, focused on carbon capture use and storage, and we want to share information today on that. But it's uh, this. I uh, just want to acknowledge this is not a topic that could be uh, covered in two days, let alone two hours. And so, what we hope to do is share some insights today, but more importantly, we hope to introduce you to a number of uh, of, of reference materials that are available and uh, through, through various uh, work that our speakers have done. Uh, we have an incredible group of speakers today and their detailed bios are available. So I'll just give a real brief uh, uh, intros this morning. Uh, 
And uh, I'm going to introduce all the speakers now in the order that they're going to be uh, be presenting, just so we can uh, more easily have the flow from presentation uh, to presentation. So we we basically have three different presentations, but the first one will be uh, presented by two different speakers. Uh, Cindy Yielding is currently Senior Vice President of BP America, uh, and uh, Cindy, uh, let me just give you, many of you know the, uh, the, uh, are aware of what the Offshore Technology Conference is. It may be the, the largest conference gathering in the, uh, in the world, and it was unfortunately uh, canceled this year. But, but Cindy is the chair of the Offshore Technology Conference. And uh, in addition to, uh, to keeping busy with a ton of other activities, uh, she served as the uh, as the uh, leader of of really what was the management team for the National Petroleum Council's carbon capture use and storage study that was uh, released and approved in December, and uh, that that report titled the Dual Challenge, uh, and uh, she both she and Nigel will be presenting information on that report today. Uh, Ni Nigel Genvey has over uh, uh, 23 years of global oil and gas industry experience in technology, exploration, development, and production. He is currently at Gaffney and Klein, and Nigel leads their new global carbon management practice. Um, Nigel led uh, significant components of the uh, NPC uh, dual challenge uh, study and report. And he's going to specifically be presenting some some areas that he directly uh, was involved in. Um, our uh, our next presentation is on on some several work of the National Academy of Sciences in this area, and and Dr. John Holmes, who is the director of uh, director and scholar for the National Academy's Board on Energy and Environmental Systems. Uh, and, and so this is a board that includes the activities on climate mitigation and access, assessment, electricity system modernization, uh, fuel economies, technologies for light duty vehicles, and energy innovation. So, um, and then most of you know that, uh, that the National Academies is, the, uh, is, one, is probably the independent organization that has completed uh, uh, studies on climate-related topics uh, to a greater depth and breadth of, uh, of almost any organization out there. So John is going to be able to share some of the more recent and and uh, and planned work in this area. And then uh, uh, our third speaker is going to tie things together is Lynn Orr, who is the uh, uh, Colleen and Colton Beal, Professor of Petroleum Engineering Emeritus in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford University. He previously served as Undersecretary of Science and Energy in the United States. He was Director of the Precourt Institute of Energy and probably, and, be, and before that, the Director of the Global Climate and Energy Project, which, which began in 2002. So I think um, um, Lynn can be described as one of the founding leaders on this topic. So we're very excited to, uh, uh, that Lynn could join us today. So um, with those introductions, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hand it off to Cindy and, and Nigel to, uh, uh, to present, uh, the, the, make the first presentation. Um, mute. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Sorry. There was that awkward moment where I couldn't unmute myself. So um, just like to say thank you so much to Jim and Elizabeth for having us here today. Our objective is to review the work findings and recommendations of uh, the recently almost completed a completed uh, National Petroleum Council study on carbon capture use and storage. So next slide, please. 
Thank you. So Nigel and I will be tag teaming, as Jim said, um, but we're going to start out with some context because we believe it's really important that you understand you know, sort of the framework of the study and sort of the guardrails that, that we, we followed. So first, a little bit about the National Petroleum Council. It's a federal advisory committee. It exists solely to advise the U.S. Secretary of Energy and the executive branch of government by conducting studies. Um, we work in multidiscipline teams, collaborating, and it's really focused on getting consensus and advice. Um, the one thing that the NPC doesn't do is advocate. So we're just really putting uh, answers to questions. So if we move to the next slide. Um, so here to start us off is, is uh, is the series of questions. So uh, our story begins with a letter from Secretary of Energy Rick Perry in 2017, requesting a study on how the US could move to application of carbon capture, use and storage at scale. Please note, he didn't ask us, should the US move forward with CCUS, but rather, how could we advance? And that's an important, uh, important part of our story. So next slide, please, Eric. So um, the request asked five questions. Uh, what, what's a little bit of the context uh, with regard to US uh, and global energy demands um, and environmental benefits coming from carbon capture use and storage? What barriers uh, must be overcome to deploy CCUS at scale? How should we define success? And then how can we establish a policy framework um, and stimulate investment to advance the deployment of CCUS. And then finally, which you'll, you'll see as we get into the, the findings and recommendations, what uh, hurdles should be addressed to help progress CCUS investment to enable the US to con continue to be global technology leaders. So next slide, please. So a little bit about our team. Overall, the study team included uh, more than 300 participants from uh, more than 10 different organizations. Um, a lot focused in the U.S., but many multinational companies and then um, several dozens of, of international members. One thing uh, that surprises people is over two thirds of the study participants are actually outside of the oil and gas industry. And just to give you an example, our coordinating subcommittee, which is the sort of leadership group of the, the, the working team of the study, represented, we had upstream, downstream oil and gas, we had LNG, biofuels, we had lots of power representation, uh, NGOs and, and government representatives in the, in the study team. So much, much broader subject than, than oil and gas. Um, so if we go to the next slide, the one Secretary Perry's questions was um, you know, sort of define what moving to CCUS at, at scale means. Uh, and we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what, what problems we were, were trying to solve. So um, we, it, for the purposes of our, our work, we um, in the US, we collect about 25 million tons of CO2 uh, per year uh, today and we think that at scale means that we would be capturing and storing or utilizing about 500 million tons so it's a pretty big um, incremental shift um, it would uh, scale would require uh, barring any huge technology changes most of the um, co2 movement would be through pipeline infrastructure and that is roughly the equivalent of uh, about uh, three quarters of the U.S. oil and um, liquids infrastructure we have in the U.S. today. So would be moving about 13 million barrels of equivalent of CO2. Um, incremental investment in the hundreds of billions of dollars with uh, support for almost uh, um, well, 250,000 jobs and uh, impacts in the GDPs of about $20 billion annually. Now to do this, um, as I said earlier, we really need to focus on policies, clarifications of regulations, legislation, and incentives to uh, move us forward um, with ex current, currently uh, used um, technologies. We also need to continue to invest 
in innovation, technology development, and testing of new, new technologies. Um, we believe this requires collaboration between um, a range of governments, certainly federal government and states, but um, and also a number of industries. And um, certainly, we would need uh, understanding and confidence in carbon capture use and storage. And um, you can't underestimate the um, the impact and the need for public awareness and understanding that this is a safe set of, of technologies. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so we know you guys really kind of uh, get this, but we just wanted to make sure that you understood how we're thinking about carbon capture, use, and storage. And with, we um, describe that as a sub technology supply chain where we engage a broad spectrum of technologies to create a carbon management system. So CCUS is a process that begins with capturing CO2 emissions from industrial sources or directly from the air. That uh, CO2 can be uh, transported or moved directly into useful products, or more often with the, the technologies that are available today, gases are compressed and transported to be injected uh, underground where the CO2 is, is uh, permanently and safely stored. So a key point for us is there are many different elements of these supply chain and they can be linked together to form the building blocks of a CCUS project. And we'll touch, we'll come back to this a little bit later in the talk. Some of these technologies are mature and can be used today. Some require further development and some haven't been invented yet. So um, I think let's, let's move forward one more slide. Okay, thanks very much. So um, another thing we wanted to make sure that everyone on the call understands um, is we used the framework of the dual challenge uh, to set up the case for carbon capture use and storage. And that is the framework for our study. So we wanted to make sure that we shared um, our insights and what, you know, what the dual challenge actually means. And it's it's represented well by these, these two graphs on the slide. Um, the first is around um, every indicator points to a growing population and expansion of relative prosperity worldwide. The demand for energy will be increased. And certainly um, as illustrated by historical data, um, it's clear that carbon dioxide CO2 emissions are, are also on the rise. So as a global society, we face this fundamental di dilemma that we've referred to as the dual challenge of providing more energy to support growing populations while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we believe that this is one of the fundamental challenges that society faces today. So just um, the next slide, please. So um, another thing that, um, that we wanted to emphasize, and we're using an IEA slide to help show you, you know, CCUS is not uh, the magic bullet to solve all of the world's um, carbon dioxide emission challenges, but uh, it is part um, and potentially a very critical part that we can, we can start to act, grow and execute on today um, it's very much part of a clean energy portfolio. And so we see this as a critical piece of an all of the above solution to address emission reductions. And um, we also, so we think it's, it's part of the solution. It's not the only solution. Um, but we also think CCUS uh, technologies that are under research and development offer some really good approaches towards a negative emission scenario, which may be required to reduce excess carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. And I think that, that John and Lynn will touch on that a little bit more in their presentations later. So next slide, please. So some things that we, we I think many of you already know, but we discovered as a team as we move forward. So we just wanted to share these pieces with you before um, I turn the, the uh, presentation over to Nigel uh, for context on our economic framework. But uh, we really wanted to highlight for all of you that um, the US 
has become the world leader in CCUS. We have um, many decades of successful of experience in um, enhanced oil recovery. 10 of the 19 industrial scale projects, at the time we published this study, which was 4Q of, of last year, or when we went through, uh, are here in the US and they represent 80% of the world's uh, carbon capture um, capacity. We already have 5,000 miles of CO2 pipeline, which uh, represents about 85% of the world's um, existing CO2 pipeline. Um, we have a great government leadership uh, program and support uh, within the Department of Energy. They have decades of experience of uh, cutting edge research, leading R&D programs, and collaboration in, in testing um, and demonstration. And we actually have really good policy support in place. As we get into the next few parts of the presentation, you'll see there are certainly places that we could clarify, enhance policy, but the regulatory framework and the policy support, we have a very, very good start, courtesy of some great work that's been taking place over the last few decades. So with that, let's move to the next slide and I'll turn the presentation over to uh, Nigel to share some of the uh, methods we employed to um, frame the study. Many thanks, Cindy. Um, thanks to, to Jim, John Guy, of course, and Marshall Nichols at the NPC, and, and indeed Elizabeth and, and Eric and members of the National Academies Committee on Earth Resources. I think as Jim noted earlier and mentioned earlier on, I had the pleasure um, to be the alternate chair um you know really the the deputy for for cindy really in that management team um and also i was involved um in the delivery of kind of two key elements of the study the cost assessment and the roadmap and cindy's going to show you uh, the roadmap later on um so indeed one of the key elements of the study was to evaluate the current state of costs and economics uh, to derive the level of incentive um, required to achieve wide-scale deployment of CCUS. Of course that's um, you know quite a, an ambitious um, but yet thorough bottoms-up analysis of CCUS across the largest sources of carbon emissions that comprise 80% of all US stationary sources. So before I start to populate this, uh, this chart, uh, we'll go through these axes um, and, um, and let you orientate you around the approach and really the outcomes, of course, of the, uh, the analysis that we did. So as you can see, the left vertical axis is the cost to capture, transport, and store one ton of CO2 plotted against the bottom horizontal axis, which is not a timeline, but it's the volume of CO2 abatement possible. This was an annual abatement uh, based upon data that we pulled, the total emissions for the US being on an annual basis, 5.3 gigatons or 5,300 million tons uh, in 2017, and all stationary point sources really comprise roughly half of that. 2,600 million tons per annum. And of course, we evaluated the largest of those reaching up to 2,000 million tons per annum of, um, of CO2 emissions. So if just advance, and that will bring up um, a, um, an insert, great, thank you. Um, and as I said, um, you know, mainly using data from the Environmental Protection Agency, we focused our analysis on CO2 generated from the top 850 stationary emission sources. Those sources uh, of CO2 include ethanol, power plants, cement, steel, natural gas processing, fertilizer, and others. And of course, as Cindy mentioned, you know, the participation of, uh, of um, experience and expertise from those industries, of course, is critical to include in such a study. And in in order to perform the economic analysis, of course, we also had to make um, economic assumptions, and you'll see those listed there at the bottom of that, that list, a 20-year asset life, a rate of return of 12%, 100% uh, equity financing, 2.5% inflation rate, and a 21% federal tax rate. Now, by performing this analysis, really it provides uh, the value of incentives, as I mentioned, and the business case needed to enable deployment. 
the case for rd and and how this could lead to a reduction of costs and Cindy's going to take you through that later on and really an economic wide basis for an economic impact assessment with respect to jobs created and GDP added. Now that's indeed referred to as the value of CCUS. Now by, high, by having an economic model, of course, it also allowed us to assess the impact and merit order of various types of incentives, including tax credits, both production investment based, lower cost of capital, private activity bonds, and loan guarantees, other financial structures, et cetera. And so we were really able to go down to a bottoms up analysis and look at the merit order of each one of those. And then that, of course, then moves through into our, our recommendations. Great, next slide, please. Now, of course, to get alignment on cost in inside the study, we reviewed publicly available reports, supplemented this with industry expertise and experience of things like owner's cost to really ensure representative total as built cost. We then applied an open book approach to a set of uniform financial assumptions that I took you through needed to produce that 20 year cash flow and a fixed level incentive over that period. Now that can be different to the basis used for specific projects. However, our objective was to look across all sources, 850 of them across at a national level. And therefore we decided earlier on that in order to evaluate the level of incentive, um, we wanted to use a fixed cost basis and um, not, as not all incentives are linked to inflation. And sometimes this incentive based inflation can be different to other cost based inflation rates. Decoupling those really we, we felt enabled a clear view of the costs and the incentives needed. And knowing that, that all of that context is important to clarify and to ensure transparency of, we therefore provide a publicly available cost assessment tool and reference costs for different CCUS applications online, allowing public access to change not only the cost financial assumptions, but also the methodology that we use to present our output. Now this is available online and it's my pleasure indeed to host this on the Gaffney Klein website. The address is there on the slide. Next slide, thank you. So let's populate indeed that framework, that those axes with, uh, with our analysis. Um, here you'll see two key things. The gray shaded area is the marginal cost curve made up of CCUS implementation for various point sources, each having a cost and volume plotted in an ascending cost manner. This is, or this is as of the 27 data set that we used. So it's a snapshot in time. It also uses existing technologies that are commercially available and can be used at scale. Now there are three illustrative examples of stationary sources highlighted over there on the left, uh, one for ethanol fermentation, one for cement and one for natural gas fired power plant running really as base load. The red color indicates the cost of capture, the major elements in the supply chain. And this can vary, of course, from each source type, as well as each source, depending upon its scale. The darker red color indicates the cost for both uh, transport and storage, stroke enhanced or recovery use. Now note that the width of each of those bars in this examples are, is illustrative. It's expanded in scale for visibility uh, purposes only. So it does not indicate the actual true volume for each of those sources. Okay, next slide, please. So as previously referenced, the study really envisaged three phases of deployment and we'll describe these as, as they go, as, as they appear on the cost curve. Um, activation, expansion and at scale deployment. The first here, you'll see this blue color, dark blue color added onto the current, as Cindy mentioned earlier on, 25 million tons worth of CCUS capacity in the US. And this first activation phase, it gives us a jump start by clarifying existing federal tax policy and regulations and really no congressional action therefore is required. Those actions will activate an additional 25 to 40 million tons 
per annum of CCUS deployment doubling effectively existing CCUS capacity in, next, in the US over the next five to seven year period. Next slide, please. The next phase, the expansion phase, this is built now upon congressional and regulatory a agency action for enhancement and expansion of existing policies. As Cindy mentioned earlier on, those actions could result in yet another doubling of CCUS capacity within the next 15 years to a cumulative capacity of around 150 million tonnes per annum. Next slide, please. And then finally, the third phase, the at scale phase, uh, this is that lighter blue section on the chart, represents uh, uh, really what would be required from additional finance, financial incentives and policy support to continue investment towards the 500 million tonnes per annum of CC CCUS deployment and CO2 abatement. This level of deployment is estimated really to occur over a 25 year time frame. Achieving CCUS deployment at scale, of course, will be that additional 350 to 400 million tonnes per annum in the next 25 years. And that's going to require substantially increased support, really driven by national policies. Now, the next few slides that Cindy and I will take you through um, include the NPC process of crafting findings and supporting recommendations as an executive summary. These findings tell a comprehensive story and of course we're going to take you through those. Our first four findings frame the case for building CCUS at scale in the US. The report highlights the dual challenge and the fact that addressing cost effectively requires CCUS. Beyond the benefit to reducing emissions, the report identifies increasing deployment, of course, of, uh, of CCUS as an economic benefit to the nation in terms of jobs, market opportunities, capabilities. And indeed, we're, of course, as Cindy mentioned, a world leader with about 80% of the world's current CCUS capacity. Of course, R&D is also well underway with the Department of Energy investments of about $4.5 billion over the last 20 years really underpinning the future um, of, the, of deployment. And we also have the beginnings, of course, of uh, meaningful public policy. Now, the next slides will cover the remaining six findings and corresponding recommendations. Okay, finding five, activations. So as we described in the cost curve, the report is underpinned by a three-phased approach, starting with what we call the activation phase. This phase is focused on actions from federal agencies, as you can see. For example, the IRS and US Treasury can focus on clarifying existing tax policy and regulations with regards to 45Q. The EPA can work to enhance and strengthen class six well permitting process. And the Department of Interior and States can clarify rules around poor space access and ownership. This will take, of course, away one big obstacle and that's uncertainty. And these actions could therefore double that capacity as I mentioned earlier on. The map, as you can see, portrays really, of course, the in industry in its infancy with local CO2 emission sources being delivered to nearby subsurface CO2 storage sites, primarily enhanced oil recovery. During the activation phase, about $50 billion worth of CCUS investments over, over 20 years would result. These investments and multiplier effects, of course, will support 9,000 jobs and about $1.4 billion in annual GDP. It expands the baseline, this phase, and should also increase public support, allowing us to move on to the next phase. Next slide, please. The next uh, phase, expansion phase, <clears throat> will require Congress and regulatory agencies to expand and extend existing policies and strengthen legal and regulatory framework for CCUS. Recommendations underpinning this funding include expanding the use of tax credits, 48 A and B, and financial tools for CCUS projects, private activity bonds, master limited partnerships. There are also recommendations to fund improvements in well permitting processes, of course, as the number of projects increase across different states, as well as additional regulatory reform at the federal and state levels, focused on poor space ownership, long term liabilities, and of course, pipeline infrastructure development. These actions will result in another doubling, as I said, of CCUS capacity. The map, as you can see, illustrates a further expansion of sources and sinks that would enable to across the US 
And of course, more CO2 being transported through pipelines, um, connecting different sources to regional sinks. Um, and during that expansion, this uh, expansion phase, an incremental $124 billion of investments is estimated um, over 20 years and level of investment supporting about 42,000 annual jobs and $4.5 billion in annual GDP. Next slide. And so uh, phase three at scale deployment, this is our view at least as a the start of this is about 25 years away, but it's really achievable with further increased support driven by federal policy. Uh, using proven technologies and today's costs with operational improvements, we of course foresee the need for a mix of financial incentives amounting to about $90 um, to about $110 per tonne of, of CO2. Our map offers now, uh, offers now demonstrates a broad range of sources and sinks, as you can see, with a broad pipeline distribution um, system across the continental US, illustrative, of course, of uh, di full scale distribution of the supply chain. And during that phase, total investments reach about $680 billion over 20 years, an economic impact of about 236,000 annual jobs and uh, nearly $21 billion in GDP, as Cindy mentioned earlier on. So just because the results are phased out of 20, over 20 plus years doesn't mean the work should be deferred. Of course, it really, this is really around a phasing and uh, an approach. Um, and because of the complexity of many of these solutions, you know, really work must begin now. And I'll hand over back over to Cindy. Okay, great. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you, Nigel. So, um, you know, Nigel just talked through you know, basically the supply chain as it can be executed, you know, and, and uh, expanded to scale using proven technology. So those graphs are all built and charts are all built on things we can do today. I mean, capture, transport, mostly via pipeline and uh, a couple of different ranges of subsurface storage. But um, we also recognize that a commitment to carbon capture use and storage must include an ongoing commitment to research development and demonstration. So this, in the study, we have a whole volume on technologies and we describe how they've been developed and we build the case for additional investment in those developments. So um, this chart really just uh, demonstrates that uh, the technologies in the supply chain today vary in maturity and we've, we've got uh, a range of technologies in capture, compression, transport, use storage, and EOR across the x-axis and then um, a technology readiness level assessment across the Y axis. And you can see um, uh, there are a lot of uh, technologies, you know, ready for a large scale demonstration as well as uh, technologies in their, their infancy. Uh, so uh, what we wanted to do in the next couple of slides is, um, is highlight, you know, that there is good news in that we understand uh, amine capture and we know how to do it. Um, and we haven't actually made recommendations for a lot of investments in that particular area, but we do recognize and recommend that, uh, or um, support the idea that uh, we focus RD and D on less mature emerging technologies. The potential for breakthroughs is great. And those step changes that could result could reduce costs and lower the investments uh, that we calculate today needed to unlock the benefits of at scale deployment. So if we go to the next slide, um, and we'll now talk about uh, finding number eight, research and development. And uh, so just as we've seen through a similar commitment to renewables research, additional R&D will lead the way to further innovation, performance improvements, and cost reductions over time. That's why our report um, calls for $15 billion of uh, federal uh, government funded or government funded RD and D over the next 10 years to support fundamental research, pilot programs and demonstration projects focused on these emerging technologies. We also recognize that industry uh, will also continue to partner with government 
and be investing uh, significant resources of, of its own to further this research and development. So if we go to the next slide, um, so this was one of the uh, healthier conversations we had over uh, the duration of the study was, you know, how to really, really assess the impact of uh, our d, &D. Um, And fortunately, we had uh, Team DOE, Jared Daniels, uh, John Latinsky, a whole host of experts to help us with methodology and um, ways of, of trying to, to value techniques to uh, demonstrate the impact of research and, and development. So the little simple orange arrows on this slide actually have a, a huge, um, a huge uh, sort of implication and they, they represent uh, maybe up to a 30% uh, cost reduction just in, in aiming technology on this, this slide. Um, if, if we were to achieve just a 30% reduction through learning by doing, uh, technology advances and improvements, we'd achieve a tenfold in return on that investment of $150 billion cost savings at the deployment uh, scale. So um, really, really big potential for uh, future technologies and cost reductions. Um, and just the last point we wanted to make on this is, is you can see that um, these arrows could also serve to help flatten that cost curve out, enabling us to, uh, to move you know, from the sort of 500 million um, tons per annum collected to uh, much greater numbers at, at similar costs. Um, so all of this could, could be really great investment uh, with regard to technology. So let's, um, so yay technology. <laughs> let's go to the next slide, which covers our last two findings. Um, so we just wanted to emphasize uh, findings uh, nine and 10 from the study. And these, are, these represent the full range of findings that Nigel kicked us off with. Uh, the first is um, that none of this, um, maybe with the exception of phase one, could actually be accomplished without public understanding, public confidence, and public support. So the report recommends engagement approach informed at providing information to the public to help secure that support and answer any questions that they may have. And then, so that's really the, the crux of finding nine. Finding 10, we believe that the oil and gas industry actually has a huge amount to offer in ensuring U.S. leadership in CCUS deployment. The sector has a lot of experience in, in designing and safely deploying major projects required to execute at scale deployment. And we have a really good knowledge of full value chain uh, integrated systems and experience in developing and deploying new technologies. So, um, with that, we just sort of, we'll go to the next slide and just a high level summary of the, of the key messages. You know, the US is currently the world leader in carbon capture um, use and storage, and we are uniquely positioned to deploy CCUS at scale. Uh, CCUS can be deployed today. However, the economics are challenging and that deployment at scale requires clarity, uh, stable and enduring uh, policies and regulations and indeed given current costs um, incentivization to catalyze development. We firmly recommend in, uh, investment in research development and deployment uh, will help create further applications, additional opportunities, and um, quite likely to drive down costs. And we believe that uh, put together, these actions can stimulate a new industry for the US creating jobs capability and at economic growth, not only for the United States, but for the global, global marketplace. So um, a couple of more pieces, a couple of pieces more we wanted to share with you guys. So if we go to the next slide, um, we'll just share a little bit about the study. And uh, first, Nigel mentioned, we do have a roadmap. There's actually a two page spread in our executive summary um, which kind of summarizes a lot of the content from this presentation and certainly from the executive summary uh, recommendations and, and uh, deployment. So we'd encourage you uh, when you look at a copy of the executive summary to look at that roadmap to um, 
look for uh, you know, sort of the really, really high level uh, value of financial incentives, the business case to enable deployment, the case for R, D, and D, and the economic impact of uh, the jobs and analysis. Nigel is holding it up, um, our two-page spread. So a little bit more about the structure. If we go to the next slide, uh, there are Oh, there's, the, there's what Nigel was holding up. So that's the roadmap over there on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, a little bit more about the structure. All the study recommendations and findings um, are captured in the first volume of the report, which is referred to as the executive summary. Um, that is, has been published. It's available from the NPC website. You can order a copy of it or you can download a PDF online. And again, that is a final version. If we go to the next slide, um, there are two more uh, volumes that can be downloaded loaded from the NPC study, but uh, John Guy and, and the team at NPC are still sort of in the final process of, of editorial um, and uh, kind of just making this, putting this into the NPC sort of final format but you'll see a volume on uh, the analysis of CCS deployment at scale that includes the energy outlook, the economics, the policy and regulatory and legal enablers, and also then a um, absolutely brilliant uh, volume on technologies, which kind of provides a historical look and uh, and look forward on each of the elements of the, the supply chain. They're also supporting uh, appendices and some supporting papers that you can find on the website as well. So just, we'll just romp through the next couple of slides. Um, so if we go to the next one, uh, just a shout out for um, our authors supported again by this team of over 300 people, but um, these are the, the uh, leaders of the chapters in the volume two. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see um, the contributors and lead authors on the technology volume. So um, just finally, to give you just a few more minutes for question, if we move to the last slide, um, we just want to say thank you. Um, thanks to the Department of Energy, as we alluded to before, um, they were always there to clarify, answer questions, uh, just a brilliant um, sort of uh, team to be uh, steering us and, and advising us um, and answering, uh, you know, sort of keeping us on track. Um, certainly the National Petroleum Council um, leadership team, who many of whom are on the line today, Nigel, um, recognize them and the staff for their patience uh, in, helping us through this is process. And there was also another study going on at the same time on um, US infrastructure. And uh, we collaborated a lot, um, held hands, consoled each other and shared sort of best practices as we went through it. Um, probably the most important thanks were to all the participants. I think many of you are on the phone, uh, saw a couple of names flat by who helped uh, deliver this study. And we'd like to just say thank you for your contributions. It's a labor of love and we do uh, appreciate and love all of you for uh, helping us get to, to this point. So I think with, with that, we'll turn the floor back to um, Elizabeth and Jim. I don't know if you wanna take five minutes for questions or um, move to the break, but that concludes our study, our overview of our study. Cindy and Nigel, thank you so much. Really appreciate that great overview. And I, I first, I didn't at the beginning, I acknowledge because I'm a bit biased on this one because of uh, my, my day job, but, uh, uh, but uh, having brought this to the, the committee, I, I, I thank the committee members who, who did review it and see value in making sure we included this on, the, on our agenda. Um, the uh, what what we we do have time for questions while we're while we're getting queued up and if uh, waiting for some folks to raise their hand. Let me first acknowledge we did have a, a request on the chat function asking for the link, Nigel, and then somebody else answered it. So let me let me also add that 
the full report uh, is available at uh, dualchallenge.npc.org. And um, so we can list that and make that available somewhere. Or you can just go to the NPC website, npc.org, and find a link to get there. So, uh, so all this is available online, downloaded, no, no cost. And it's in the final stages of being tidied up to be very pretty uh, digital publications. Um, so uh, with that, and while we're waiting for other, what, what, let me also acknowledge that right now we're gonna focus on, on uh, clarifying questions right after each presenter that focused on their material they, they addressed. There will be time at the end of the session to have a broader CCUS uh, questions and, and would be the time for anybody that wants to make, you know, just offer broader thoughts to do that at the end of the, the, the webinar. So first, just to get us rolling, Elizabeth, uh, would you like to, uh, do you have a, uh, any questions to kick off uh, and, or others that may have come in from the chat box? Thank you very much, uh, Jim. And uh, thanks a lot, Cindy and Nigel. That was a really great overview. Very, very uh, comprehensive. And, and I know we pressed you into a very short time frame. You did a, a, did a fabulous job with that. So thanks, thanks so much. Um, I actually had a, had a question. This is my own question uh, uh, for, towards uh, some uh, comments from Nigel. And that was with regard to your, your uh, cost analysis. You're using the capture, transport, and storage as uh, the three the three of the variables uh, in making those calculations. And I wondered if you could break out the, the, the way that you considered storage. I understand that EOR is part of that, but I suspect it wasn't all of that. I wondered if you could, could elaborate a little bit on how the, the storage uh, costs were, were calculated or brought into the picture. Yeah, thanks Elizabeth. So we, we basically had um, uh, storage costs. Um, we basically reviewed, um, there's a nettle, DOE nettle cost um, tool for CO2 storage. We reviewed that, updated it with uh, um, just like everything else, sort of industry viewpoints, experience uh, from, uh, from the NPC members and contributors to the study. Um, and so basically we ultimately uh, ended up with uh, um, both for EOR basins and also saline formations a regional cost basis. And uh, you'll be able to, uh, to see what those are for the same informations um, online, um, actually within uh, some of the materials that we make uh, publicly available. And of course, they're also covered um, in the actual report um, itself as well. So yeah, basically um, a regional cost basis uh, for the different geological parameters, um, you know, to represent the various, the variation that there is across the US. Perfect, thank you very much. Jim, I'm looking, I think, uh, yeah, there's another question on the chat box. Uh, should, do you wanna read it, Jim, or shall I? Oh, uh Oh, that go ahead. That's uh, when when will the tool be available to the public? Is that the is that no no? There's one that just came in uh, from oh. John Marsden. Um, I can go ahead and read it. Yeah, go ahead and read it because I must not be seeing it on my. Oh yeah, okay. I got to scroll up. Okay. Ken and I'm not sure uh, if this is for for Nigel or Cindy. Um, so can you please elaborate a little more on the incentives requirements, the ninety to one hundred and ten dollars per ton, and what forms these might take. So yeah, um, Cindy, do you want to do you want to tell I can I can I'll kick off. Um, so really, congressional action, of course, um, to implement economic policies amounting to to that level of support. Now, of course, there's there's various types of policies and also combination of existing incentives that can be blended together in order to achieve that overall amount. So rather than stipulate, you know, spe specify which we think that, you know, those could be, of course, the evaluation of those policies that would uh, be most beneficial to, to the US in order to achieve the objectives, you know, they really should occur concurrently, you know, really during the prior expansion phase to evaluate which ones would be best in order to be blended. And of course, it's a performance-based um, type system. So of course, the level of, as Cindy mentioned, also may actually be lower than that depending upon, of course, 
the um, deployment of new technologies and uh, return on that uh, investment of R and D. Yeah, and I, I think John, you know, clearly just because I'm sure everyone's wondering about that, you know, one form could be a tax on carbon, um, but as Nigel mentioned, um, that could also be. Uh, changes to existing incentives um, or, or policies. And, uh, you know, we found pretty quickly that kind of everybody had their, uh, their own idea of uh, what would work best. <laughs> and, and it was, uh, you know, people viewed these through very specific business lenses. And we, we learned uh, through the, um, through the uh, collaborative and consensus driven uh, NBC process that uh, it really um, wasn't in the best interest for us to define exactly how that set of incentives could be uh, realized, but rather to describe that given current technologies and current costs, we believed they, they would be required and uh, leave that to the policymakers to determine the most beneficial ways to move forward with that for a broad range of industries that would depend on these uh, incentives. Okay, thank you, Cindy. Uh, thank you, Nigel. Just in the interest of time, and I'll remind everybody, we're gonna have time to come back around, but I wanna try to give you at least a seven minute break. And we will reconvene promptly at, uh, at 1210. So get up, stretch your legs, uh, and, uh, and we'll join you in a few minutes. Thank, Thank you all. You.
I, according to my clock, we're at 1210. So I, I presume everybody sees some of the faces. I see people reconvening. And first of all, let me say that the National Academies has done a lot of these and, uh, and have, have determined that having a break in the middle of a two hour webinar is an important uh, component. And I know I've been on a number of these marathons that go two, two and a half hours or longer without. And, and I'm, I'm uh, quite pleased that that's the uh, best, best practice that's been developed to give people a chance just to, to, to if nothing else, uh, you get a chance to, uh, um, uh, to refocus your thinking and, and stay attentive. So I think that's all, all a, a good thing. Um, Reminds me, uh, I, I digress just for a minute while we're getting, uh, reminds me that, uh, that I remember in grad school, we had four hour long classes and, and, uh, and uh, uh, with, with maybe one break. And, and so I think there's some, uh, some value to keeping this in the hour time frame uh, between, uh, between uh, uh, material. So with that is uh, it, we're, we're going to transition to uh, to John Holmes with the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Sciences. and John is going to take a look at uh, negative emissions technologies and deep decarbonization. So I'm not seeing John on my screen. I assume he's up here and, and ready to go. Ab absolutely. Um, okay, and John, I'll can turn it over to you. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, thumbs up. Good, perfect, good, good, good. Hey, um, what I wanna talk about today, and this is kind of a continuation of, of what was talked about with Cindy and Nigel, is, is to talk another aspect about carbon capture and sequestration, and that's negative emissions technologies. And then I also get the opportunity to kind of bring in a little bit of the, the topics that you're not getting into in this webinar because of time, which is the full energy transition. Um, so we're going to start off talking. Next slide. Hopefully, next slide. Yeah, I, I, we're going to be talking about a report that we did on negative emissions technologies um, that was released in, in, in 2018. Can you hit it again? And what negative technologies are, are, are approaches for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it either on or underneath the Earth's surfaces? Real basic definition. Um, the report considers the report that we did only considered storage of carbon dioxide in terrestrial and coastal ecosystems or geologic reservoirs. So we didn't look within this report in using enhanced CO2 uptake in the ocean. There's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is obviously when you go to the oceans, you reach, you go into international waters, you go into international regulations. We were looking at negative emissions technologies and research activities that could be done within the continental United States. Could you hit it again? But I would note that the academies, because this was kind of an overlooked area, we are going to start a study, hopefully within the next few months, on looking at using enhanced um, ocean uptake for another way of doing negative emissions technologies. Move on to the next slide, please. So what are the rationales for, um, uh, for looking at negative emissions technologies? Obviously, it's about climate change and reducing carbon pollution. Um, as, as Cindy and Nigel also noted, right now there's um, some tax credits available associated with the 45Q that, that, that provide some economic incentives to look at this, but also if we do believe climate change is, is kind of a fundamental issue that we're going to have to be addressing in the future, then looking at negative emissions technologies and being the leader in negative emissions technologies will increase U.S. economic competitiveness and technological leadership. Um, also, there is a potential to use negative emissions technologies to control climate to control carbon pollution with less decrease in fossil fuel use. So what, we, what a real fundamental element 
of this study that is one of its most fundamental conclusions is NETs are best used as a component of the mitigation portfolio, of the emissions mitigation portfolio. They're no different than looking at reducing carbon emissions from CO2 um, from, from light duty vehicles, which I work on a lot of times, or from the electricity grid. Um, rather than a way that we're going to somehow rebalance the atmosphere by sucking out a whole bunch of CO2. Because if you remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store it in the ground, that's no different than not emitting CO2 at all from a vehicle or from a, you know, from a jet or whatever. Um, but also in some cases, it may be cheaper to do a negative emissions technology. As all of you know, there are some sources of CO2 emissions that are called the hard to decarbonize ones, the ones that are associated with processes, um, the ones that are, um, let's say, where, where the volumetric density of a fossil fuel is really important, such as when you're on an airplane or something like that. Anyways, go on to the next slide. And so this is one of the one of the places that you know negative emissions can can help us continue to use fossil fuel emissions where there are fossil fuels where they're absolutely necessary because some of the characteristics, some of the energy density of them, um, rather than trying to move to something else. And the option that we, or the uh, example we always used was looking at um, jet fuel. You know, well, we could develop cellulosic biofuels to develop, um, to run jets on. Um, that could be expensive, requires land to grow. We obviously didn't even put electrification of jet on here because everybody knows it's it's kind of tough to really think of a of a long distance jet running on electricity. But even if we thought of cellulosic biofuels as a potential solution, they're very expensive and they require land resources. Um, the other option is to just capture CO2 and offset the CO2 that comes from the from um, commercial aviation um, using carbon, um, you know, direct air capture or some other mechanism. Um, if, if this would cost $50 per ton of CO2, that would add about 50 cents per gallon. You can do the math. $100 per ton of CO2 would add about a dollar per gallon to the cost of fuel. Sometimes that can be a competitive um, solution compared to moving to cellulosic biofuels if we want to eliminate net carbon emissions from commercial aviation. Move on to the next slide, please. Okay. So the task statement for the committee is fairly straightforward. It was to look at some of the unanswered scientific and technological questions that are, you know, used to to look at the benefits, risk, and sustainable scale potential, increase the uh, commercial viability of carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. Hit it again. Um, real important element, and this was the, the most popular element of the study, was really to define the essential components of a research and development program and the specific tasks required to answer those questions. Anybody who looks at that report will see a very detailed research agenda associated with all the elements, all the negative emissions technologies that we, that we looked at. Hit it again. Um, and estimate the costs and potential impacts of such a research and development program. I didn't realize I had this sequence like this, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I hit it again and see if we move on to the next. Uh, recommend ways to improve such a research and development program. Hit it again and we should move on to the next slide. Um, committee members, um, I was the study co-director along with uh, Katie Thomas, who's at the board on um, atmospheric sciences and climate. She's now no longer with them. She's at the Climate Alliance. This is the group of people that were the committee members. As everybody knows, the committees are very important. These groups um, develop a, a consensus report. They write the report. Um, and if you know the background of these folks, they stretch from people who are soil scientists who are foresters to people who are interested in um, mineral mineralization and uptake of, of CO2 naturally through rocks, as well as the, a group of people that are very understanding of direct air capture and the technologies associated with that, as well as coastal carbon. Um, 
would you hit it again? And then let's go to the, the types of negative emissions technologies. This is what really got me interested in this study. Quite frankly, I talked my way onto this study, and that was because it's a fascinating set of technologies. It stretches from, you know, kind of the low-tech natural carbon solutions, enhancing soil uptake of carbon, um, forestry approaches, to kind of the high-tech solutions, the direct air capture solutions. And then there is the, and, and, and Peter Kellerman would kill me if I said the science fiction approaches, but the carbon mineralization approaches are just fascinating. There are rocks out there that are if exposed to the ambient atmosphere, naturally absorb CO2. What do we do with that? How do we turn that into something that's a technology that can be utilized? All that is covered within the report. Um, very interesting. And then there's some, like I said, that are that are a little bit more niche, coastal blue carbon, using the high productivity of tidal wetlands to store carbon. Unfortunately, there's not a large geographic extent, so there's not a lot of potential there in terms of the absolute amount. Um, and then the familiar bioenergy with carbon capture that combines something I love, producing electricity, with something we're all here to talk about, which is removing carbon. Anyways, next slide. Um, one of the most fundamental elements, and I'm not going to show the detailed tables of the research agenda that we came up with, but one of the most fundamental elements that the, that the committee came up with was what they thought were the relative rankings of, of, of costs for these, as well as the upper bound for safe potential removal of carbon using these different types of technologies. Um, in a later slide, I'm gonna show what's kind of assumed to be required for reaching deep decarbonization or net zero by, by mid-century. But what these numbers show is that the upper bound for the safe and for the low cost options, don't quite do it in terms of the amount of carbon capture and sequestration through negative emissions technologies that we really anticipate that negative emissions technologies are gonna to have to do. There's a lot of cheap potential out there for afforestation, reforestation, forest management, and agricultural soils and backs. Those are low cost, let's say under $100 per ton of CO2, as well as fairly far along in terms of our technological know-how in terms of how to do those, but they don't quite add up to um, the level that we need to reach. And I will note, our committee was fairly conservative when they looked at the natural carbon solutions to make sure that we were only including what we considered, what the committee considered, was a safe number. And when I mean a safe number, we're not utilizing, we're not changing land uses so that there's not this trade-off between food versus energy versus carbon sequestration. So for example, for the backs area, for the biomass that was available for um, bioenergy with carbon capture, we only used, um, we used the, 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 the um, uh, Oak Ridge billion ton study, but then we cut that down and used what was only considered the waste biomass available. We didn't look at changing land use. Anyways, next slide, please. No, oh, and yeah, let, let's say again, I, <laughs> I forgot these things are popping up. Safe means, you know, without large scale land use changes that could adversely affect food availability and biodiversity. Next slide. Yep. Oh, okay, we got another one. Um, upper bound also means, and this is an important one, you know, when you look at the forest management, when you look at the agricultural soils, and you look at those numbers, they really mean a full adoption of agricultural soil conservation pro uh, practices, forest management practice, waste biomass um, um, capture. Now, some of those, when there's an incentive for farmers for agricultural soil conservation, we can get a lot of uptake. Um, for some of the other ones, for the forest management practices, they're a little tougher to actually um, um, get that upper bound. And waste biomass um, um, capture, everybody knows, it takes a lot of effort to move that waste biomass around. That's a fairly 
diffuse source. Um, so there's a lot of discussion on, on moving biomass around. Next slide, please. Hopefully the next slide. Oh, okay. To keep going, uh, keep hitting it. Um, uh, yeah, four options are ready to be scaled up. And I think this is very important, but their capacity is substantially less than the expected demand or need for negative emissions technology. Next. Um, so the, um, an overarching conclusion of this is that there's really two technologies that form kind of a backstop for negative emissions technologies. Those are direct air capture and carbon mineralization. Both of those have were only limited by for um, direct air capture for the amount of sequestration volume that we have in the in the country and in the globe. That's a that's a fairly large number and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. For carbon mineralization, there's a huge amount, although the technologies to actually unleash that amount is fairly large. Um, but then there's, a, you know, other ones, blue carbon has capacity um, that's less than other options, but it potentially could be done just when we enhance our coastal resilience processes. Next slide. This is a real fundamental I issue. What is the potential market for NETs or equivalently how much carbon uptake is needed to meet the Paris goals? Again, next slide or next. Um, this may be a little hard to see, um, but what you see here is a kind of a representative pathway for meeting, um, you know, net zero by mid-century. And the teal colored stuff at the bottom is the negative emissions contribution to that level. What that shows is that by mid-century, we should be at 10 gigatons per year, and by end of century, by about 20 gigatons per year to meet that Paris um, two degree C type trajectory. So that implies that we need a significant amount of negative emissions technologies or net contributions to even meet that. And, you know, within the, the tan and within the light green areas is really where some of the carbon capture and sequestration that we talked about in the earlier part. Um, and also what this shows, and I think is very interesting, is that negative emissions technology can be started before we, the, the old idea was negative emissions technologies would come in after we've depleted all our other emissions mitigations approaches, after we've reduced carbon emissions from vehicles, from the grid, from buildings to its maximum extent. And what this shows is that negative emissions technologies come in a lot earlier. They come in as we're doing these other mitigation technologies or approaches. Next slide. Um, yeah, 10, 10 gigatons are what we need globally, about one gigaton within the United States by mid-century, hit it again, and 20 tons by, globally by the end of the century. Um, and again, that's about two gigatons um, per year in the United States. Next slide. So what I want to transition to real quickly is some activities that we're doing at the National Academies to think about deep decarbonization and how negative emissions technology and how carbon capture and sequestration move into that area. Um, what we believe is that, you know, the National Academies is uniquely positioned to help with this whole deep decarbonization set of activities because not only do we have great expertise that we can tap with our volunteers, but we're extremely cross-disciplinary. Cross um, you know, I'm here talking in front of a group that has, you know, tremendous expertise on, 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 on the earth sciences or whatever, but I can also go within, you know, down one floor at the academy's buildings and I can find people that are experts in policy and global affairs, also in human behavior and in, you know, education and things like that. The academies stretch across this interdisciplinary spectrum that we're going to have to look at for deep decarbonization. What we're imagining is a multi-approach, um, uh, multi-activity approach to deep decarbonization. The workshops, 
the consensus study and uh, form a long-running standing committee, similar to what you guys did or, or, or Elizabeth did on unconventional hydrocarbons. Next slide, please. So what do I think the value proposition for the academies in deep decarbonization is? Well, everybody knows this, but deep decarbonization is not going to be one. I love academies reports. I've done so many of them. I can plop down an academies report. We can plop down an NTCC report, and that ain't going to be the end of the story. All of us know. Deep decarbonization happens across the U.S. economy with millions of actors across all sectors, and it's going to happen over generations. It's not going to happen based on one report. And so this transition needs support from organizations that provide independent, scientifically sound advice, can engage across all dimensions and all issues, and have the longevity. And I think this is a very important longevity to operate through a generational transition. And I think that's where the academies can contribute. Next slide. I want to brag a little bit about our first activity, you know, our workshop on deep decarbonization, because what we did was we put this whole scale question to our presenters. And, and this was what we fundamentally tried to address. This is from uh, you know, an old, old board member of mine, Mike Ramage, it's fine to have one great negative emissions technology. It's fine to have great one zero carbon, uh, you know, a solar cell, an electric vehicle. But unless you reach scale, it doesn't matter. It's not going to impact the problem. And that was my emphasis, scale, scale, scale. You always got to think about scale. So what we did in this workshop is we took um, – you know, four sectors, including um, direct air capture, and says, okay, let's have the models, modelers come in and tell us what we need to do to reach deep decarbonization. You know, what percentage of the vehicle fleet has to be at 100% EVs. And then let's talk to the industry and, tell, and have them tell us what that means for scaling up within the industry. Um, at the end of this presentation, I put a couple of slides that just shows some of the different industries and, and what they responded when we put that objective to them. Um, because like I said, I think it's very interesting hearing from Toyota to respond to, you have to have 50% of your vehicle fleet being, you know, zero emissions by 2030. What does that mean for Toyota? What does that mean for the industry? Anyways, um, so that's at the end. It's a plug for that, for that, um, uh, for that study though, or for the workshop summary. Next slide. Right now we're doing a consensus study. We hope to have an interim report. We plan to have an interim report um, released in, in December or January. One of the things that we have developed over time is what would be the most important contribution that this first consensus study could look at. And what we're really focusing on is not that end goal, that 2050 goal, what does it look like? What is that optimal pathway to look like? We're really focusing on the near to midterm. What do we have to do to change the trajectory? Also, what's very interesting about what we're doing is that we're not just looking about technology. It was very clear that societal elements and policy elements have to be a full partner in this study. And that is what we've, what we've put together. The, the task statement, all the information on the committee is up on our website. Next slide. And this is the committee roster. You'll, you'll see some familiar faces, but what you will see though, if you look at the background, is that we have people from not just the technology side, but we're kind of balanced between the technology, people that think about societal transformation, people that think about policy. What isn't here though is a technologist that says there's only one technology solution. Everybody that is, you know, that we brought in that are that are technologists are really thinking about the broad array of technologies, and they don't have a single horse that they like to ride. Um, and I think that's that 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 should leave it. Um, oh, one more slide because this this transitions into Lynn. Okay, so. Two, two other activities that I want to just put on everybody's um, radar. One is that we actually did do a study, a similar study on negative emissions technology that looked at carbon 
utilization. And all I will say is thermodynamics is a drag in terms of, you know, CO2 is CO2 and, and stuck together for, an, for a reason, and it takes a lot to break that baby apart. Um, I will also, and, and, and when we also think about, you know, the, the need to move, I want to bring up a study that Lynn was part of, the America's Energy Future Study, 2008, 2009, where we said one of the most important things we got to figure out for the electricity sector is whether carbon capture and sequestration was going to work. We need 2008, 2009. This is a top priority. We need to have demonstration projects. We need to know if this is going to be a viable option for the electricity sector. And yeah, yeah, you know, and, and here we are, uh, 2020, um, and and we're still talking about it. So anyways, it's, I, I don't know if that's good or bad, but at least we're still talking about it. Um, the rest of the slides, we're not going to go through. I want to leave them there. They are talking about what we heard at the DP Carbonization Committee and scaling up for other technologies, not for CCS. Thank you. John, thank you very much. We're going to, we have time just for uh, uh, a couple quick questions. Let's, to, while people are thinking about uh, anything they want to raise, there was an interesting dialogue going on in the chat function about uh, jet fuel and, and uh, just to kind of paraphrase, because you've probably been having had time to really check this chat out, John, but maybe you could reply that there were questions about uh, 10 kilograms of CO2 per gallon of jet fuel and, and, uh, and, and questions about what that meant. And then somebody clarified that that's uh, 3.15 kilogram of CO2. And then there was some other, other uh, uh, qualification that that would mean 80% capture efficiency, which seems high. So John, what, when, when you do some of those calculations, you wanna add a little bit of, uh, of uh, background on that particular- I, you know, I, I would uh, have to go on I would, negative emissions? Yeah, I would, I would have to go back to the report as to how we got that. But I know, I know the committee and it was reviewed, felt that that was an equivalent, um, uh, you know, an equivalent amount of carbon you would have to take out of the atmosphere to um, offset one gallon of, of petroleum. And, and maybe Lynn, I, I don't know if he has any um, uh, thoughts on that. I can go back to the report and actually figure out how we how we calculated that. But I know that was a, that was what we figured would be what needed to be captured to offset that one one um, gallon of of jet fuel. Okay, and I think it was. Uh, I I would say I, I saw the way in your in your um, in your presentation as as an example primarily to highlight why negative, looking at negative emissions is important rather than looking at there's there's always a lot of uh, questions on how do you calculate how do you validate and and that's something that, uh, that that Nigel's very much involved in in trying to figure out how do you how do you verify these uh, these uh, what it what it means to uh, say sequester uh, certain volumes so with that, let me just look. I'm not seeing anybody else raising hands. Were there um, um, uh, any, other, any other folks that want to jump in or comment on that or other real quickly? And we'll have about a minute before we transition here. Hey, um, I, I, I will add, I, I mean, remember when we're talking about that, that capture thing, we're certainly talking about direct air capture. We're talking about something offsetting that CO2 from the one gallon of fuel using perhaps direct air capture. So, so you know, we're, we're talking about capturing that at 400 parts per million or, or whatever. Um, and clearly we don't capture, you know, for direct air capture, you're not trying to capture 80, 90% of what passes by. That's a nice, not the nice thing. That's the that's one of the easier things. You don't have to do like you do when you're when you're when you're capturing out of a power plant where you're trying to get 90 percent, 95 percent of the CO2 stream. You're just you're you're capturing volume. You're you're you know you're you're just trying to move CO or remove CO2. 
some may pass through your, you know, your, your capture system. You're not trying to capture every bit of it like you would through a concentrated stream. Okay. John, thank you very much. We're going to transition over and we'll, we'll turn over the, uh, uh, turn this over to Lynn Orr to do our, our third and our kind of wrap up presentation. And then we'll, after some discussions with Lynn, we'll have an opportunity to open up to everybody for a broader discussion. So um, thanks all. And Lynn, you, you have the floor. Uh, do we, are you hearing me now? We've been fussing with the mute here. So, okay, yep, good. I, I can um, hear you, Lynn. And I think once you start talking, it'll, the screen will reshift so we can see you. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks to the previous speakers. They said all the important stuff. So my job is just to, um, to uh, uh, kind of summarize and wrap up and add my own opinions, which I'll do happily. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, if you look back at what we've talked about, there really are three parts to the process. I mean, there's the capture side of, uh, of uh, CO2. Uh, there, we need to get it to some place where you might store it or use it. Um, and then there are lots of options for storage. Uh, uh, and some, there are plenty of potential options for utilization, uh, uh, only a few of those in use now. So. So I'll try to say a few words about each of these uh, and then add a little commentary and uh, uh, color to some of what's been said previously. Next slide, please. So uh, this one, I, I suspect this slide might be hard for some to read on their screens. The, uh, the, the intent of the slide is to start on the left side with uh, the uh, various kinds of places you might uh, um, capture CO2, and there are really two big classes of sources, those that are concentrated, so places like a power plant or, uh, or an ethanol plant or uh, uh, something like that, where the, the concentration of CO2 in the, in the gases uh, is much higher than it would be in the atmosphere. And then there are the low concentration sources in the air or the atmosphere is the obvious one of those. And there are big differences. The, the um, uh, concentration in the air is about 400 parts per million. Uh, in a, a coal-fired power plant, it could be 12 to 15 percent. So, uh, and maybe five or six percent in a natural gas-fired uh, power plant gas. So, so there's a big. Uh, uh, John, I think, said that thermodynamics was a drag. Um, I, I have a lot of students who would probably agree with that statement, but uh, but I don't personally. <laughs> <laughs> agree. It's actually, of course, uh, a limiting factor um, that uh, it's just a lot easier to capture CO2 from, uh, uh, and it takes less energy to do so from a concentrated source than it does from a low concentration source. So for direct air capture, we're battling the, the, uh, that low concentration. You have to move a lot more fluid to, uh, to do the capture, and it takes more energy to do that. The middle uh, part of the slide shows the various kinds of uh, uh, capture processes here. There are lots of them. I'm only going to say a word or two about a few, um, but they range from the standard uh, solvent uh, uh, kinds of capture that's used in natural gas separations and refining operations um, uh, uh, all over the world uh, to things that, that membranes are used for separations in some place. Uh, places and there are a variety of other options, um, uh, some of which are being uh, uh, used now and others of which are not. Um, then um, then at, on the right hand side of the slide, there are the, all the kinds of ranges of potential uses. Uh, uh, you could, for example, uh, uh, store uh, the, the uh, CO2 in geologic formations, you could make fuels or chemicals, we could make minerals, uh, combustion materials, or they can be taken up by biological systems. Uh, so uh, there are plenty of options there as well. Uh, and I think um, uh, several speakers previously made the point that what we do needs to be a portfolio of many of these, uh, these items. There's no single solution, but there's, there are plenty of options for, uh, for moving to the next step. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So, uh, so let me say a word or two about the, the capture side. Um, the, this is typically the highest cost uh, step in, a, in any kind of uh, carbon capture and storage project. Um, the, the cost numbers that the MPC study provided uh, show this uh, quite clearly. Uh, most commercial systems now use uh, uh, typically amine solutions of one sort or another um, uh, for separations. This is done at commercial scale already around the world, in natural gas separations. Uh, and in refining. Lots of other systems are being uh, investigated. Uh, various kinds of solid sorption, fuel cells, ionic liquids, uh, lots of research underway. Uh, not much at a scale. This would all be at the kind of low TRL levels that, uh, that um, uh, are typically um, uh, at the, the research end of, a, of the, the, uh, the, the study system. Um, cost will still be the issue. Um, and uh, the point again, the concentrated is easier than dilute ones. And all these separations require energy and sometimes water and other, uh, other requirements as well. And we shouldn't forget that because the, the energetic costs of some of the things that are being talked about are really quite substantial. Next slide, please. So, the, so here's an example of something that's, that I would call a hybrid system. Um, the, a big question I think for us going forward is uh, to what extent do fossil fuels like coal or uh, natural gas stay in the mix? Um, it's easier to do things I think with, uh, with natural gas in terms of capture than with uh, coal. The concentration of CO2 in the effluent gases is typically lower, but, um, but there's a lot less of other issues uh, to deal with. Um, but you can ask the question, well, do we want to keep a fossil fuel uh, like natural gas in the energy mix? Here's one version of uh, a process that might allow that. Um, there's a demonstration plant uh, run by Net Power outside Houston that uh, basically does an, an air separation unit uh, upstream um, and then a, um, uh, they use pure oxygen to burn the natural gas. The fluid that comes out of that is a is high temperature mixture of CO2 and water. Um, that can run a turbine that, uh, where, that uses CO2 as the working fluid for the turbine. Uh, on the downstream end, you have a, this CO2 water mixture. You cool it down to knock the water out and recompress that to the inlet uh, pressure for the, the turbine. At this point, if you just keep doing this, this is a, a loop that, um, that uh, uses CO2 as the working fluid. You can't keep adding CO2 forever, uh, of course. You have to take some out and you take it out at the uh, high pressure side uh, uh, and uh, with the cool CO2. Um, and then that's really already at the conditions required for storing the CO2 in the subsurface. Um, this, these supercritical turbines can be much smaller because turbines are just little wings and the mass flow over the wing is what determines the thrust uh, on the turbine. And that the mass density of CO2 in these kinds of conditions is quite a bit higher than it is for steam. So these turbines can be smaller. Now, we'll see about how this competes on cost, but the additional cost of removing uh, the CO2 in this, uh, this cycle is pretty small. Uh, and in dry places, it actually makes fresh water. So, so it's um, uh, a different version of it than, than the solvent separation. Uh, we'll see how they do on cost. The efficiencies are actually pretty good um, uh, for these turbines. Next slide. The other option is to look at the low concentration source. This is the direct air capture version that uh, Carbon Engineering is a company that's uh, doing this in uh, Canada. Basically, they use a potassium hydroxide solution uh, to capture the CO2. Then they make uh, uh, pellets of um, uh, carbonate and then uh, uh, regenerate that using uh, you need thermal energy to do that. And then a Fischer trope synthesis to make a liquid fuel. Um, they, uh, they claim uh, uh, in publications, which I've seen some people argue with, uh, that they can get the costs around $100 a, a ton. Um, we'll see, of course, uh, uh, 
those kinds of cost estimates are often done by optimists, uh, I've noticed. Um, but, and you also have to make some hydrogen to stick back on to the CO2 for the fish trope synthesis. So there are energy requirements here in a, a big way. Um, typical estimates I've seen call for like four times as much energy uh, to make that fuel as it would uh, you would get by burning it again. So uh, there would be big energy requirements for this. Next slide, please. So assuming now that we can capture all that CO2, the next step of course is to transport it. Um, this point was made uh, earlier in the talks that uh, we, we actually know how to do this. We have a lot of experience, particularly um, uh, with the big pipelines from the, the Four Corners area down to the oil fields in the Permian Basin uh, in Texas and along the Gulf Coast. Um, uh, there's now a lot of experience on how to do this and the costs are pretty well known. So if we're gonna do this at really large scale, uh, Nigel, I think, made the point that, uh, that we will need a pipeline network to do this. Um, and there are big investments involved. Uh, on the other hand, they will carry big quantities of CO2, and so therefore the cost per ton uh, will be relatively low. There are some folks talking about ship transportation, um, uh, a potential project in the North Sea, for example. Um, no question can be done. It's, uh, it's akin to LNG shipping. Um, but it, it's expensive. Um, truck transportation can be used, but it's really only feasible for, for uh, pilot scale. Next slide. So the next big question, of course, is where would we put the CO2? And there really are quite a few options here. Oil and gas reservoirs for uh, enhanced oil and gas recovery are one possibility. Deep formations that contain salt water uh, now Coal beds or shales, there's no question you can adsorb CO2 on, uh, on uh, coals or shales uh, and replace the adsorbed methane that's there now. And uh, that can be done. Whether this is practical, I think, remains to be established. Um, EOR is the only economic um, uh, approach in the absence of a carbon price and in a, with a better oil price than there is right now, for example. And then finally, um, there are basalt systems. Um, uh, CO2 is, uh, uh, John made the point that, that uh, uh, CO2 can be reactive with rocks. Well, basalts are, are one of those. Uh, particularly if the CO2 is uh, dissolved in water, then it can, uh, can react and make uh, uh, solid minerals. There's, uh, that happens, so there's a test underway in Iceland doing exactly that. There's big volumes of uh, basalts out there, but there are plenty of uh, remaining practical questions whether you can deliver the CO2 and keep it in place. One conclusion I think is really quite strong and that the storage capacity worldwide is large compared to the feasible injection volume. So, so uh, and the next slide makes that point. Next slide, please. Um, well, okay, it'll be the one after that, but uh, I'll just say here that you know, putting CO2 into the subsurface is, um, requires a number of things. First of all, you really do have to have a, uh, a sort of low permeability layers known as seal rocks to prevent the CO2 from migrating back to the surface. Uh, and you need that in any of these settings. If you, if you displace CO2 with water, it can be trapped in places uh, as bubbles by capillary forces. Uh, many of the, uh, the disposal uh, techniques will uh, take advantage of those. CO2, of course, dissolves in water, and those of us that drink soft drinks know that that's true. Um, and so eventually, uh, CO2 will, um, will dissolve in uh, saline aquifers, for example. And CO2-saturated water is slightly more dense than water uh, without the CO2, so the driving force for CO2 to move to the surface is replaced by a um, a driving force for it to really go down uh, slowly. So the trick is to keep all the, the CO2 in place uh, during the time it takes for solubility to happen. Mineralization reactions in most sedimentary systems are pretty slow and probably not big enough to make a big difference, uh, but that's not true in the basalt system. Next slide, please. So this slide does illustrate uh, the, some potential storage locations. Um, the, the 
reddish cross hatching is oil and gas fields, the blue is saline aquifers, and uh, the other bits are uh, uh, coal beds. And the dots on the slide show uh, large scale sources of CO2. So you can see that there are plenty of rocks in the US that, uh, that could be, um, uh, in principle, could be used. Um, the uh, deep decarbonization or the negative emissions groups uh, pointed out that uh, not every one of these will be suitable and uh, uh, they'll need to be close to pipelines and such like. But there, um, I think it's, it's clear that the, the, the volume of rock available to do this is not going to be the limiting factor. It's going to be other things like the cost. Next slide. So what about enhanced oil recovery? It's, only, it's really the only big market that we have right now for CO2. Um, and we have a lot of experience um, uh, since the 1970s. Uh, when I, at the beginning of my career, I worked on the pilots uh, in some of the pilots out in West Texas uh, that, that uh, uh, were done in order to see whether to build those pipelines from the Four Corners area. Uh, we really learned a lot about how, what happens when you inject CO2 into rocks in the subsurface. Um, and uh, this slide here shows that CO2 can actually displace oil very efficiently um, if, uh, if the pressure is high enough. Um, and we know why that happens and how to organize it all. Um, and uh, uh, we've spent, uh, many of us have spent our careers trying to figure out how to, to, to use less CO2 um, to recover oil than, uh, than you might have needed. Now, of course, we need to re-optimize that and to, to find a way to, um, to use more CO2, that is to store CO2 more effectively and leave more of it behind. Um, but there is good evidence that we can use depleted oil and gas fields um, to do this. Now, they're not distributed everywhere across the country, so obviously we need other uh, other systems, but injection schemes that maximize storage and limit gas cycling um, are uh, are uh, well within our capabilities now, and uh, we can do that. Lots of interesting engineering problems to be sorted out there, but uh, but we know a lot about how to do this. Next slide. And an important question, uh, I think, in terms of, uh, of using all of this is to, is to what extent does that actually reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions? If you're producing oil, burning that obviously emits CO2. Um, uh, so, uh, so it's important to ask whether uh, the amount of CO2 that might be stored during enhanced oil recovery makes a difference. And if you just take some typical assumptions of uh, of emissions from um, burning a barrel of oil, of the amount of CO2 that's ultimately stored at the end of the recovery process, and how much of conventional oil that might offset, then the, the mean greenhouse gas reduction is about 63%, although there was a big range depending on the oil. Um, so uh, with some adjustment of processes to make them less efficient to store more uh, CO2, you could get close to offsetting the, um, the uh, CO2 emissions from the oil. So it does have lower emissions, but, uh, but, but almost certainly not zero. Next slide. So the dissolution part in brine is, uh, is pretty well understood as well. Um, this, these are some simulation results of, uh, uh, that we did with, with uh, my students uh, looking at the instability that's, uh, that's produced when you uh, have that, uh, that CO2 at the top uh, dissolving in the water and then the dense water falling down. Um, it does mix things on a, a convective time scale, but, uh, but unfortunately that time scale is still hundreds to thousands of years to dissolve all the CO2. So that makes the point that we really need to retain uh, have good seal rocks, and so that will be part of part of the characterization of any potential site. Um, next slide, please. One last point. Um, if you take a molecule of methane out of a natural gas uh, reservoir uh, or a shale um, and oxidize it to CO2, uh, you can put it back in the same spot uh, and have volume left over because the molar density of CO2 is always 
uh, larger than that of methane. Uh, and that's true even in the uh, absorbed uh, adsorbed systems as well. So in principle, you can take the CO2 out of a, I'm sorry, take the methane out of a natural gas reservoir, oxidize it in a power plant uh, and put it back um, without, uh, without exceeding the pressure of the original system. So, so we should be thinking more about uh, storing in uh, depleted gas fields as one way to, uh, to accomplish the, the requirements. Next slide, please. So let me say uh, at the end here a little bit about uh, CO2 utilization other than EOR. Um, the, if you think about what we use at scales that are consistent with the, the scales of uh, making CO2 through burning fuels, well, obviously one of those is fuel. So if you could go back and make this whole thing circular, um, then, um, then uh, that would be a good thing. Unfortunately, of course, it takes lots of energy to do this, and I mean lots. Um, uh, and uh, in order to do that, we would really need to have very large uh, quantities of, uh, of, for example, solar electricity. You could do that at a couple of cents a kilowatt hour. You could make, um, you have room both thermodynamically and, uh, and cost-wise to make another uh, conversion with uh, some efficiency that's less than 100%. Um, uh, in my days at DOE, uh, we did a series of, uh, of cost projections, which suggested that, uh, that, that the two to three cents a kilowatt hour for solar uh, PV is, uh, is within reach. I mean, we have a shot at doing that. So uh, if you have excess power, then of course, uh, uh, storing um, uh, uh, that power as uh, a liquid fuel is a, uh, an important uh, uh, one, maybe one potential uh, energy storage system that might make some sense. Uh, construction materials we also make uh, use at very large scales. So cement offers potential opportunities at scale. Chemicals are smaller. All of these have uh, cost competitiveness issues. Um, now, uh, John mentioned the biofuels option. Uh, that is certainly one option. Um, you know, you can think of uh, this as, as, as what we might really like to have is a, um, a system for capturing CO2 out of the air. It should use solar energy, um, and it would be very nice if it would self-assemble. You say, no, wait, we have those. They're called plants. Um, and, uh, and so the biological systems are actually the they're really the, the only ones that, 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 that do the job at very large scale right now. Um, but of course, enhancing those uh, in ways that, that do additional capture is a non-trivial exercise as uh, John uh, illustrated pretty well. So, so cost competitiveness here matters all the way along. There are lots of options and we're gonna need all of them. Next slide, please. So here, for example, this is a kind of a, a um, uh, uh, imaginary, well, fantasy version uh, might be a better uh, description of using lots of solar and, uh, and wind power uh, to make uh, low carbon electricity, lots of uh, electrochemistry, maybe uh, photoelectrochemistry with light involved, um, or uh, thermal uh, uh, transformations as well with good catalysts uh, in order to make fuels and use those for transportation and the, the whole thing is uh, is uh, uh, circular and you can see the biomass uh, part of this as well. Um, it, it takes lots of components uh, and lots of elements, uh, lots of opportunities for research. So let me, next slide please. Next, next slide, there we go. Um, I just say that in terms of CO2 markets now, I uh, really already said this, that the only big one is uh, enhanced oil recovery. Uh, some of that is um, uh, natural CO2. So the, the part that's uh, uh, reducing emissions is really uh, smaller. Um, beverages and food industry uses are there too, but they're really quite small. And of the, of the big large scale CCS processes operating now, most of them are for enhanced oil recovery. 
um, and uh, only a few involve aqua for injection. So, and I really said all this already, so go to the next slide, please. There we go. So let me close with just a, uh, a, a kind of a short list of, of uh, obvious R&D opportunities. Um, really at the top of the list is lower cost capture. Uh, lots of advanced chemistries and materials are under investigation. We need to do that and work hard. Hybrid capture systems like the power plant I described are a possibility. Uh, Co-optimizing UR and CO2 storage to uh, improve storage and reduce costs. Um, lower cost monitoring, I didn't really talk about this, but if we're gonna do large scale uh, CO2 injection over long periods of time, we're gonna need to monitor what happens. Uh, basalts and shales of storage formations are much well, less well described uh, than um, uh, conventional uh, sedimentary rocks. Um, we need to work on costs of uh, characterization. We need to pay attention to induce seismicity. This is something I also didn't talk about, but if you inject lots of big quantities of fluids at high pressure, you, uh, you create the potential for seismicity in some systems. So understanding when that happens and what to do about it is important. Um, we need to go well beyond uh, power generation uh, metals and cements are the big obvious uh, targets there. Um, uh, using electrochemistry and thermal chemistry to uh, do CO2 reduction uh, has lots of uh, potential interest. Uh, again, if the energy supply is sufficient. Um, and then improving the various uh, agricultural practices and other processes that you build soil carbon or use biological systems uh, is a big opportunity area as well. So next slide. So uh, next, uh, there we go. So let me just conclude, um, you know, the portfolio of CCS technologies is sufficiently developed that, that deploying at scale uh, is, uh, is far enough, uh, to, is feasible, I will say. Uh, the steps laid out by uh, Cindy and Nigel uh, as, uh, as to what might it take to do. Plenty of work to be done, but you know, we can do this if we choose to. Um, it has to be one of a wide ranging portfolio and that portfolio should have uh, a spectrum of primary energy resources, transformations and uses. It's to be as diversified as we can make it with a big strong R&D uh, part at the upstream end. Um, lots of R&D on capture, hybrid technologies, negative emissions. Uh, we really need the full range. <laughs> Direct air capture I think is technically doable, but uh, it's gonna have to be less costly than uh, if we're gonna do that at scale. Um, and we just need to keep at this. Uh, uh, Cindy, I think, said it pretty well. We, we need all the technologies we have, uh, plus some more we need to invent. Uh, so let's get together and get on with it. Thank you very much. Lynn, thank you very much. That was great. Um, what I we have a question on our on our chat, but it's a broader question. I think I would uh, I think we'll, we'll it might be a good one to kick off our uh, our our kind of kind of discussion with all the speakers. So I, I can before I get to that, let me just inquire if folks have some specific because Lynn had a real strong technology focus, and are there any any specific technology questions? Uh, and uh, that people like to pose, feel free to uh, raise your hand and in the, in, on the uh, uh, feature and we'll call on you. Uh, I'll, uh, also, uh, as, I'm, I'm, uh, as the committee knows, I sometimes uh, am, uh, put the committee members on the spot, so I'm not opposed to doing that as well. And uh, so anyone, any, any kind of questions uh, for Lynn or what we'll, we can, like you said, we, we can, we kind of oh, uh, 
Bridget, let me, Bridget has a question. Uh, go, your floor is yours, Bridget. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, Lynn, I had a question about the supercritical C2 uh, power plant you know, integrated with um, with methane production. I was just wondering, is that you know, do you know is that still kind of a theoretical technology possibility, or are there any pilots of that so far anywhere that might be demonstrating that? Yeah, there's one. Um, there there is a, uh, a kind of a 50 megawatt demonstration scale uh, 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 plant that's uh, that's. Uh, in testing uh, outside Houston, uh, run by NetPower, uh, so it's a uh, um, uh, it's it's beyond the uh, the, the uh, uh, theoretician and lab scale kinds of things, um, but not yet at commercial uh, uh, commercial scale. Um, you know, all the components uh, have uh, the the uh, some element of testing. We know how to do air separation. That's done all the time. Um, the combustor, you know, <laughs> I've heard it described as a uh, uh, trying to to uh, keep a candle lent, uh, uh, lit uh, while you're blowing a, 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 a an extinguisher right past it, the fire extinguisher right past it. That's what all that CO2 is. So the, they have to design the combustors to keep the the, the, uh, the stream uh, stable, but um, but but they've been able to do that. The CO2 turbine is, um, again, lots of work going on in a variety of versions of those, and they would have lots of other applications if, uh, if that technology works. There's some materials issues, but they look, uh, they look solvable, uh, and that reduces the size of the turbines a lot. So, um, and then the downstream um, uh, thermal handling and compression, those are all uh, technologies that are in hand. So, so I think there's a, there's a pretty good chance that if they can meet the cost targets, that, uh, that, that there's an opportunity here. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bridget. Um, I think what we'll do is just in the interest, we'll kind of make this open this up more broadly. We have a couple other questions coming in on the on the chat, and um, let me just uh, so we don't lose it as this rolls up here. Um, uh, Lionel Martinez uh, had asked a question, and this I'll, I'll open it. Uh, Lynn, you can kick off since you were the speaker, but we'll open it to all the uh, all the presenters uh, to respond. Have you looked at the environmental risks of the CO2 capture and storage process? What are the risks associated with the process and the chances of the CO2 release from the geological formations? in parentheses, rock fracture from added pressure if it is a saline formation, and should some form of reservoir pressure management be included in the project? And uh, just as a moderator, let me add, uh, because the National Academies has done some work on induced seismicity, that, that maybe that, that would be a, a something else that that, that uh, John or Elizabeth might want to comment on. So with that, let me, let me turn it to the various uh, presenters will let Lynn respond first and then and then you guys can move between all of you. Yes, uh, absolutely. The uh, potential environmental impacts are, are uh, a very important uh, part of thinking about any uh, any project um, and uh, and the the pressure management will be part of uh, of uh, any project as well. Um, we um, well, there, there are kind of two aspects of that. One is the, the potential for induced seismicity, but the other is just uh, um, making sure that you protect the seals and, uh, and keep all that in place. A typical kind of uh, storage system is one where it's not just one layer of seals. You, you have many layers of low permeability rocks over uh, a typical uh, storage site. So um, uh, it's, not, uh, it, it's not quite as... Uh, uh, risky as it might sound if you just think about a thin seal there. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, characterizing it and, uh, and designing it and monitoring pressure and uh, being careful about hydraulic fracturing, those are all important parts of it. Um, we, uh, if, if, if we choose sites carefully and operate these big industrial processes in a way that, uh, 
that we know how to do, then, uh, then the risk of leakage is quite low, except with the potential for well failures. You know, uh, if, if a CO2 storage site is gonna, gonna leak, it's gonna be because the, uh, some aspect of a well uh, failed. We know, uh, again, how to build uh, wells that don't leak and how to, to uh, fix them if, if, uh, if there's a, um, an issue. Uh, but again, it requires just uh, careful uh, uh, design and careful uh, operations all the way along. Uh, these will be big systems uh, and we want to operate them safely. John, do you want to add anything on? No. No, this is Elizabeth, you know, they did the induced seismicity report, and I think this this really flows into that one very well. Yeah, Jim, I can just add uh, the, the report that came out in 2012-2013. One of the big uh, concerns the committee raised, one of their big findings was of all of the energy technologies where you're injecting fluids into the subsurface, the one where they, the committee was particularly concerned because it it is the newest and, and perhaps not as at that time uh, as well uh, as well developed as, as uh, injection related to oil and gas extraction to thermal energy and so forth. Um, and that was this potential for uh, induced seismicity from CO2 injection in part because of the volumes that we were talking about that we want to, to foster and, and the lack of, of understanding a fundamental aspect of the subsurface. So it really got back to a couple of things, Lynn mentioned them, um, and that's really characterizing the reservoirs, the intended reservoirs very, very well, so that we know as much about the properties of those reservoirs as we can, and monitoring, and monitoring, and monitoring. Um, and I think that's something, because of the focus on some of the seismicity, um, uh, in, say, for example, in Oklahoma, uh, some of the work in Canada, elsewhere in the United States, that the advances in, in, in monitoring, pressure monitoring and so forth, and understanding what some of those relationships are as, as far as potentially triggering uh, small events and if those events could re lead to ruptures. The understanding is, has really increased over the last um, you know, eight to 10 years, but it is something that, that's, that has to be a careful part of the, the plans for any of these large scale uh, sequestration activities. Yeah, I could say one more thing about that. The, um, the, the cases where there have been uh, larger earthquake events uh, induced by injection have uh, almost all been related to water disposal uh, deep in deep formations that are not too far from the, the uh, crystal and basement rocks where there were existing faults uh, that got activated by the deep injection. Um, so that's that, that's a different setting than most of the ones that we're thinking about for for CO2 storage. But on the other hand, we're talking about big volumes now. In places like uh, oil and gas reservoirs, where you've taken lots of fluid out of them, that's one thing. But in, sal in deep saline aquifers, uh, it may very well require us to to uh, remove uh, uh, water, and then that uh, creates another disposal issue. So there there are real issues to be thought about. Uh, um, and care in and, and dealt with in careful engineering designs of these processes. Um, Cindy and Nigel, do you want to add anything on this? Because I know on the environmental issue, public acceptance that was a, a, a very significant part of the discussion in the in the, in the dual challenge uh, report. Yes, Cindy. Uh, we need. Uh, uh. Eric, we need to unmute Cindy. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That was a lot of heroics to agree. And I think I would just support, uh, you know, what one of the things that we found, um, you know, Elizabeth said it nicely is, you know, the, the monitoring, um, especially uh, not just the original monitoring, but longer term is, is going to be critical to um, really demonstrating that we can, you um, securely store uh, CO2 geologically for the, the long term. Nigel, anything you want to add? 
Uh, no, definitely. Um, there's, um, I think um, there's been some good comments about uh, the NRAP at all. Um, I think that was part of, of course, the discussion around uh, having a consistent, you know, standardised tool to uh, look at um, um, uh, risks, qualify, understand the risks um, associated with uh, with large scale storage, and uh, and certainly the uh, the DOE um, and other partners have been working on the uh, the the NRAP tool in order to do that, which includes seismicity evaluation, just part of the required uh, site characterization process. And Okay, th thank you. Let me, well, I'll go to the, uh, uh, the, the chat line and I'm gonna, there's a couple, um, um, one is a question and, and I think we might, you know, I, I think we, we want this to be an interactive discussion like our meetings. So if the speakers would like the, 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 the uh, person posing that Masood Alaya, I, I forgive me on my pronunciation, but uh, but if there may be some opportunity for it to dialogue, dialogue to put this in context to CCUS, but let me just pose the question. Any insight would be appreciated on is there any pilot project for geological storage of hydrogen in the US? Hmm. Uh, Lynn, I, I'm not aware of any pilot scale project. There has been some work on uh, on analysis. For example, one way to reduce emissions of uh, from natural gas power plant use uh, is to to blend some uh, presumably renewably produced uh, hydrogen as a uh, an energy storage mechanism and to to put that into the gas stream. Um, if the concentration of, of, of hydrogen is not too high, uh, uh, current pipelines and storage systems could handle that. Um, uh, but I'm not aware of anybody actually doing that. Uh, maybe others uh, could uh, yeah. comment on that. Yeah, it's Nigel here. So the world's largest hydrogen supply network is along the US Gulf Coast, um, operated by um, Air Products. And I think Air Liquide actually is part of that, sort of operates the world's largest hydrogen storage facility now. Um, it's located in Beaumont, Texas. Um, and it's a salt cavern. Hmm. So, uh, so yeah, it's actually done at commercial scales or, um, already. Of course, there's yeah. some great work being done by the DOE. Um, there's a hydrogen um, effort in the DOE looking, of course, at uh, you know, scaling to go into large scale geological storage of hydrogen as well. And of course, as, uh, as hydrogen, you know, potential green or blue hydrogen sources, um, you know, is investigated further as its role as a clean burning um, um, fuel, which of course for the blue hydrogen, the context of CCUS and of course, uh, CCUS enables, uh, you know, um, basically a decarbonisation of, uh, of fossil fuels through reforming to, to hydrogen, so. Thanks, Nigel. Um, let's see, Neil, Neil Havermail, you've posted kind of more of a comment. Let me just give you an opportunity to, uh, if you wanted to uh, uh, present that into the discussion or had, a, had something to put forward to the, the, uh, uh, the, the group, please uh, let me give you a chance to do that. Kind of while we're waiting, as as a soil. Hey, partner, hey. Oh, are you on, Neil? No, this is John. Hey, um, what I would say, soil carbon in the negative emissions technologies report was one of those motherhood and apple pies type pollutions. You know, you're not only storing carbon, but you're improving soil quality, and improving soil quality by re, you know refurbishing soils to have the carbon basis that they had when we originally started using these soils. So, you know, when you talk about double benefits, it's it's hard to say these are permanently sequestered carbon. There's certainly a turnover and there's a readmissions over you know a 50 year, 100 year time frame. 
But in terms of things that we should be doing right off and that has a fairly low cost and has some collateral benefits, soil carbon was, was an easy winner. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. The comment there, and apparently Neil's left the left the, had to get off the webinar, so that's why he, he posted that, and it's available in the chat uh, chat place if anyone who wants to to read it. Do we? Um, let me just look. Oh, we have a. Oh no, I'm I mistake. I don't think that's a. Uh, I'm just looking quick to see if we any other other hands up. So let me let me kind of call on the committee. Any any comments or input from our uh, our committee members? I guess you need to raise your, your hand so so Eric knows to unmute you. Elizabeth, do you have anything you want to add before we kind of uh, wrap things up here? The, the only, I guess the only question that I had, and, and there was uh, just I, I going, I always go back to the maps and uh, the, the maps that I think that you, you showed Nigel in part of your talk and then the maps that you had as well, Lynn, in, in yours. And obviously the focus for a lot of the discussion for the geologic storage is in the, in the onshore potential. And I know some work in the, in the US has been done in the, on the continental shelf, but that, that doesn't seem to have been the focus Obviously, there are some sites elsewhere uh, globally that, that that has been has been investigated and, and some with some success offshore Norway and so on. I just wondered if you could speak toward the the offshore potential, how much that has or hasn't been brought into the discussion and, and where that may be headed, if if anywhere. I'll kick it off. Um, this is Cindy. Uh, certainly, you know, in, in our study, we saw a lot of potential for onshore storage because we have a, um, I'll quote Nigel, a vast geologic endowment. But there's also certainly a lot of potential uh, in clastic reservoirs offshore uh, in the Gulf Coast waters um, that are well calibrated. And, you know, sort of the, the physics are, pro there's, there's probably more certainty on the, the rock characterizations and the, the uh, fluid dynamics of the, of the system than other offshore parts of, of the U.S. Um, so we see a lot of potential. There would have to be a lot of policy uh, work uh, in the Outer Continental Shelf, Land Act, some, some changes in terms of the ability to uh, store CO2 um, from sources other than, than coal. Um, but uh, there, there is certainly potential. We find it quite attractive. It might be um, cons you know, easier in terms of stakeholder engagement. Um, another opportunity that we find quite interesting are the state waters, uh, especially in you know, sort of Texas and Louisiana. And um, just a shout out for the Bureau of Economic Geology here in Texas. They've done some outstanding sort of science and analysis to uh, look at the feasibility of, of offshore storage in the state waters. And what's attractive about those is, is that's in, in Texas, at least it's the 10 miles directly offshore from the US Gulf Coast. So uh, you know, tran transportation would not be uh, a, a huge factor. It, it would be um, something you'd certainly have to um, work on, but it's, it's not as extreme as say piping something 50 or 100 miles offshore into the deeper water Gulf of Mexico. So we found it very exciting, but there's definitely some regulatory and um, uh, policy work and uh, reduction of uncertainty that would need to be applied to both state and federal waters before we could progress. And uh, yeah, and certainly, you know, so there's been, um, you know, the DOE has been, um, you know, helping um, some of those offshore assessments. Uh, Cindy mentioned definitely the Gulf Coast work um, with, uh, with, with BEG. Um, there's been some, of course, southeast offshore work um, in and around the, the other states um, along the Gulf Coast and down to Florida. And then, 
um, up the uh, the east coast and then even further up into the north and um, offshore mid-Atlantic offshore um, I think the work was done there by uh, Patel um, as well so there's been a lot of studies that have been going on funded DOE um, to uh, to indeed map and assess and pull those assessments into uh, to the onshore capacity uh, work. Excellent. Thank you very much. We have a, we have a question from Deborah uh, Peacock. She's one of our, our committee members. So uh, Deborah, well, I think you'll end up with the last question here. Okay, or it's more of a comment. I found this really, really helpful. Um, I'm in New Mexico and New Mexico Tech just received 17 $0.5 million from DOE to um, figure out if they can do carbon sequestration up in the saline reservoirs in the uh, northern part of New Mexico. But it's, it's really exciting um, for our state to be working on this. Okay, thanks, Deborah. And and let me let me do this then, and just uh, as a quick wrap up, and and uh, we'll let each of our panelists take about thirty seconds to if they wish to give any concluding uh, uh, thought or remark. So we'll just go through down according to their speaking. So Cindy, do you have any, any concluding you know, insight or thought you wanna leave everybody with? Oh no, just wanna say thank you very much. Uh, we, we had to skim over a lot of materials. So I uh, encourage you to, to check out the um, NPC website for, for further details and uh, and please follow up with with any of us uh, with any further questions you might have. And thanks again for having us. Nigel. Oh, thanks, Jim. Jim. So, uh, so no, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and again, work with Cindy, get the opportunity to work with Cindy, um, the rest of the team. Um, so, yeah, we produced a lot of materials and uh, we really want them to be useful and used. Um, so, yeah, indeed, please uh, encourage people to go on to, uh, to the NPC website for that. Um, Gaffney Klein, we've been involved in about uh, 65 CCUS screening feasibility studies for clients over the last two decades, including assignments for some of the, the industry's key players. Um, so uh, and that, that includes, of course, technology development, capability building efforts such as this. And definitely a pleasure to uh, to work with everybody on this. I think it's a differentiating report. Thanks, Nigel. John? Yeah, I just want to say thanks for including me in this and be able to talk about some of the stuff that we're working with at the academies in terms of, of these related issues. And then it was, of course, it was interesting to hear about the NPCC report and link up with Lynn. So it's it's a nice, it was a nice position. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. Lynn, and, and I should have mentioned in Lynn's bio, Lynn is a member of the Academy of Engineers. So Lynn, any, any uh, wrap up? Well, I would just say that, that uh, uh, thanks to the fellow speakers uh, for doing a good job of describing all of this. Based on all of what they said, I think we can do this. So let's get to work. Let's, uh, let's get on with it. Thanks very much. Thank, thanks, Lynn. Elizabeth, I'll, I'll turn, if you have some, before you, uh, you know, if you have any concluding comments before I kind of wrap it up and uh, also just mention that maybe the committee members could stay on for about a few minutes, uh, uh, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Jim. I'll, I'll let you do the, the final word here. I, I will just uh, chime in again with, with my sincere thanks to our excellent speakers. Uh, there were a set of really great uh, presentations in this fairly condensed period of time, and I hope you, some of you saw the, in the chat uh, a lot of uh, thanks from, from the participants, too, for, for the, the great presentations. Uh, thanks to the committee, and thanks to you, Jim, for your great work as a moderator and chair, and again to Eric for his work to keep the entire operation running smoothly. Um, just wanted to mention again, we'll try to post the presentations, uh, including the, the audio recording from the webinar in roughly seven to 10 days and we'll let you all know when that's up on the website. And I uh, just wanted to say thanks again, uh, everyone for attending today. This is a, a great a great session, really enjoyed it. Thanks Elizabeth. I'll add my thanks to the speakers, to Cindy and Nigel and John and Lynn. And thank you all for everyone attending and all your great participation. I think it's always kind of fun to watch these chats
evolving and and I think we had as many answers coming out of the participants as we did the various uh, people and I think that's a very exciting uh, uh, way to hopefully create a community in this space so we're that's one of our roles as a committee so we hopefully that that's what we're doing we will be having a, a meeting in the autumn that will be a public meeting that I, I anticipate will continue this discussion on 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 uh, energy resources in an energy transition and likely to have some focus on critical minerals and critical materials, which I think many people also will, will, will have a, a strong interest in. So again, thank you for joining and uh, 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 we'll, we will uh, adjourn the formal public part of the meeting. Again, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, we'll spend just a couple minutes as a committee getting ready for our committee meeting tomorrow. So thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.